Hey guys, Steph here. Non-techie vlog, but a psychology vlog, so you might find this interesting. Might give you insights into your own personality. So, you notice on YouTube there are lots of vloggers around. And the vloggers will use uh, some variation of a DSLR, sometimes a cell phone, but what they'll use a lot of times if they're using a camera like this, whether it be a Canon or a Sony or a Panasonic, so what they'll use often is something like this, a Joby flexible tripod with these bendy legs. And they'll have the camera up like this and they'll walk around like this talking about themselves and making coffee or something. So I have this because I sort of just got into the whole thing. I want to create films, so blah, blah, blah. I guess I'll get this. That's what people do, so might as well. I got caught into the old sheeple thing myself. So now what I just use this for now is this is a cell phone mount. So I put my cell phone and I'll lay down or sit down and I'll just put up my cell phone and I'll watch videos with it. But I don't ever use it anymore, or hardly ever, for my camera, right? I don't, I don't even have a mount on the camera. So why don't I use it anymore? Because I found that this thing doesn't provide any value. So people will hold it like this. But I say to myself, these cameras here have plenty of places where you can just hold on to it. So if you're a vlogger, you can go like this. No big deal, right? You can go like this, right? No big deal. Because well, it's a Canon, I have the camera, I have the screen facing me. So I can go like this and go blah, blah, blah. I'm so great. Look at my life. I'm getting groceries now, blah, blah, blah. Um, and this works great, right? Like it's much lighter, it's easier to hold around as opposed to having to carry around this big thing, which adds weight. Like this is maybe half the weight. This tripod is half the weight of the camera. So you're adding extra weight for no good reason. And most vloggers will not set the camera down very often. They'll just, they'll just hold it like this and talk and so on. So I can go hold it like this, right? So I'm just, it's something I had never considered, to be honest with you. Something I never considered how, do I really need a tripod? Because this is a very good grip I have here, right? So there you go. So why am I mentioning all of this on a tech channel? Understand the power of conformity. Understand how that can influence you. And I see that a lot in tech. I see that a lot in life in general, martial arts. I've seen how somebody will put forth an idea, will say, this is how we do things, and then the herd just follows along mindlessly without even considering it. And I can understand that because if you're new in a, in, in a subject, I was new in this whole uh, camera photography filming thing, I just sort of go along with what the successful people do. And that's a wise approach. But once you've gained a bit of knowledge, it might be a good idea to uh, reconsider what it is you're going to do. So, for example, in the whole YouTube video vlogging thing, so this guy Casey Neistat, he's the king vlogger, I call him. He uh, started vlogging with the Canon 70D, which is predecessor to this one, and then he went to the 80D. So then everybody went to the ADD. Now I went to the Canon because a friend of mine was on Canon. I was also influenced by that nice that guy, but mainly because of its functionality. It had this crazy autofocus capability that saved me hassle from autofocus, autofocusing. In fact, let me change that. I actually used a, another camera, Panasonic, prior to that, and, and, and the autofocusing was killing me. It didn't, it didn't autofocus very well at all. So when I found out that this camera here, these camera Canons who are the king of autofocus, when I figured out that they could autofocus really easily, then I said, ah, I'm going to go to that. So I, I went to that. Now what happened, so Casey Neistat, this big king vlogger, king vlog on the skateboard, he decides he's, he wants 4K. So he goes to Sony, but Sony has all kinds of other products, 4K video, but it doesn't have this flippy screen, which you're doing solo video shooting, you want, to, you want to have a flippy screen so you can compose a shot. Anyhow, so he goes, King Vlogger goes to Sony's because it's got 4K. Everybody needs 4K. 
the fact that it matters, you're doing vlogs, you don't need 4K. Um, so he goes to 4K and there's all, all kinds of extra work with the, with the Sony's, the color science, you got to do a lot more editing and post grading of your footage. It's not as clear, as clean as Canon. So then he goes off of, <laughs> he goes off of Sony and he goes to Panasonic GH5s. So again, the herd, <laughs> they follow King Vlogger and everybody starts buying Panasonic GH5s. Not everybody, but a lot of vloggers starts, hey, we've got to go with GH5. But GH5, for all its strengths, has terrible autofocus. And that's the key, you know, when, when, you're, when you're doing solo camera work, whether you're a vlogger or, or like me, a tech comment, a guy who comments about technology and programming, you have to try to identify that key technology, the thing that really makes a difference. Now, when you're doing solo shooting, the autofocus is huge. It's number one, in my opinion. Number two is the color science, meaning how usable is the footage coming out of the camera right out of the camera without having to make all kinds of big changes to it. Now the problem with the Sony camera is you got, you got apparently, I've never used them, but apparently you got all kinds of editing you got to do, the cover science sucks. So for me that, that, that is like extra work for nothing. Like when I had the, the other Panasonic with a terrible autofocus, it was just a pain in the butt to just set up a shot because I couldn't, I had to do all kinds of stuff, I'll spare the details just to get the focus right. With this camera, with the Canon 80D, and the cinema camera, I don't have to do any of that. It just works 99% of the time. That's one of the reasons why you buy pro equipment, by the way, is you want to get that smooth workflow. The smoother the workflow, the easier the workflow, workflow, the better quality your output, and the more you're going to be able to do with less effort. So King Vlogger goes to Panasonic. His stuff is out of focus half the time. Then he switched, then another uh, vlogger out of Canada, a guy who's a, very good with the camera work, he said, ah, you should use the 60D, the, 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 no, excuse, 6D Mark II. Now, 6D Mark II doesn't have certain 4K and this and that, so the King Vlogger goes back to 6D. So because of uh, King Vlogger in Canada and King Vlogger in New York, say, hey, we're going to go to the 6D Mark II now. Then everybody said, well, maybe we should go to the 6D Mark II now. <laughs> Uh, which is pretty funny stuff. So I love to see how the herd moves based on a couple of, of authority figures who proclaim certain things. I'm not criti critical of the herd because that is one of the primary ways in which our brains will uh, make decisions. It will look to authority figures with the um, expectations that authorities in a particular field will have uh, a depth of understanding and a level of understanding that we don't have simply because they've been doing it longer, uh, they're, they're, they're better schooled, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And there's some truth to that, but sometimes not always the case. Also, um, you have to also look at your use case. You have to decide whether or not, you know, what King Vlogger needs to do whether that applies to you, right? So I use the cameras and the videos and the vlogging as an example because it's visual. It's literally visual and you can see it. And it's something I'm sort of getting involved with because I have been trying to learn how to do better video, better photography for these vlogs, for my pro courses, and just for my own hobby, if you will. But I can tell you from my experience in martial arts, same thing you see the herd get led in certain directions. And I remember when I first started doing martial arts in the uh, early, I think it was late 70s, late 70s, I was very young. Of course, I wasn't aware of the politics at that time. But in the 1980s, at one point, ninjas, ninjutsu guys were considered the deadliest martial arts. Everything was ninjutsu, all the magazines. It was, it was funny to watch that fad. And then it moved into... Um, uh, from ninjutsu and moved into uh, Muay Thai. Muay Thai, they were, they, were, they were the killers, the Muay Thai guys. Can't be, every art, art, they just get killed by Muay Thai guys. And then it became the Jiu-Jitsu guys. The Jiu-Jitsu guys were the best ever in the 90s. The Jiu-Jitsu, they killed everybody, the Jiu-Jitsu guys. They're the ultimate style. And then it became MMA. MMA is the ultimate style. MMA is the ultimate style. Before the ninjutsu, it was the Kung Fu guys, because of Bruce Lee, right? Bruce Lee, Kung Fu's the best. 
And then prior to Bruce Lee and the Kung Fu guys was the karate guys and the judo guys. You get the idea. You see how there's these fads in different areas and different technologies. I consider martial arts fighting technologies. So same thing with programming languages now. Now we see the fad is in uh, uh, JavaScript. JavaScript is killer node in JavaScript. And it's got a lot of good things about it. As does PHP, as does Java, as does Python. You get the idea. Every language has its pros and its cons. It depends on what you want to do. Another thing that we see happening these days is the herd has gotten deep into highly complex DevOps. DevOps today are far more complicated than they used to be just 10 years ago. And there's something to be said about good DevOps, there's no question. But I think it's gotten a little bit overboard now where they're expecting uh, software developers to become system administrators. In the old days, system mins were system mins and they made sure that the environment was stable and everything was patched and up to date so that the developers could deploy their code in a stable environment. These days, there's an expectation, even with some cloud hosts, that you gotta know, you gotta be patching your own server, your own Linux distribution, all this kind of stuff. And I don't believe in that. Now, this is from a guy who actually had his own physical servers in his place in the 90s. I bought licenses for, um, uh, server software, Windows, I think it was Windows 2000, or Windows NT, excuse me, when I first started buying licenses. And I managed all, I, I, I installed, I built, I configured, I patched, this and that and the other. I managed the whole thing. And when I got rid of that, those physical servers that I managed myself and I just co-located and I, I paid people to take care of that, it was like a huge amount of headaches and burden off my back. One of the things you learn as an entrepreneur is if you don't try to be a master of everything, you don't try to do everything, that's, what a, that's a big mistake. The smart entrepreneur, the smart business owner, and the smart coder concentrates on what they're supposed to do and then hires or partners with people to do other things. So going back to the herding mentality, going back to the, the whole idea that software developers should become system developers, system uh, admins, sysadmins, and should be able to uh, totally navigate and control and manage Linux. I just don't buy it. If you can, fine. But what are you doing in this life? Are you, are you here to write really good software? Are you here to uh, maintain servers? I don't believe you should maintain servers. I think it takes away from your time to make your software even better. That being said, you should know at least a little bit. You got to understand the basics of running a server, but you don't have to know all the details. So I have one uh, host provider, DigitalOcean, where I have to know my stuff. I have to, we have to install and configure and patch. It's just a real pain. Whereas I have another host provider, Funio, which is turnkey. It's kind of a hybrid where they provide one of those control panels, and specifically cPanel and WHM, sitting on top of a cloud infrastructure. So I can install apps, I can give people SSH access, I can uh, update, choose with uh, install of Ruby or Python or PHP I'm gonna use, I can choose the different databases. It's just click, 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 no command line needed. And it's the best of both worlds. And, and if I need to do anything more uh, advanced, uh, I just make a request and they take care of it, a system in, that people who, that's all they do all day is they just manage service, servers, they just take care of the whole thing. So I have to worry about it. They take care of backups and patching, all this kind of stuff, fantastic. This way I can concentrate on making the app that we're producing better and our, my content better. I don't have to worry about managing a server and all this kind of uh, stuff. So do you need to be a server admin to uh, be a developer? So, well, some people think you do. I don't think you do. Should you know a little bit about um, DevOps? Obviously, for sure. Should you know uh, Git? You should know at least the basics of Git and GitHub and how to, uh, how to manage uh, code bases. Of course, that becomes more important only really when you have many coders involved in the project. If just one person, it's not that important. You could use Git as just a, as a nice backup, I suppose, so you can roll back any changes you made. But really, using uh, a product like GitHub or s some other uh, similar product 
it, it only really shines when you have a, a team of developers and you really need to manage um, uh, how the app is developed and how the code is uh, being developed. This way you can roll back and merge code when you need to, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, so, so source code management is more important, of course, much more important when you have multiple developers. But a lot of you out there are freelancers and this type of stuff is almost useless, except for maybe being able to roll back stuff. Yeah, learn it on the side if you're going into freelance, but don't go crazy. Just learn the, uh, the high level in terms of using GitHub. But you don't have to be a total master. Know every single thing about Git, every single thing about server administration. You just need to know your basics. Anyway, there you go. A bit of a meandering vlog, but I think I made the connection between uh, King Vlogger and coders. Ciao.